This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Explore sustainability at UC San Diego. Scientists understand the local details of air pollution. Leaping forward with solar energy use. Working to sustain teaching excellence for California's future. And a special segment from UC San Diego introduces a new consortium working together to ensure a sustainable energy future. All on this edition of On Beyond. Our planet continues to get warmer. Our dependence on imported oil grows every day, creating economic and environmental challenges. Is there an answer? At this revolutionary algae farm in the Imperial Valley, work on that answer is already well underway. Curing our oil addiction and gaining energy independence is the scientific challenge of our generation, and algae can answer that challenge. Algae is easy to grow. It doesn't need prime cropland. It requires minimal fresh water. Algae creates chemical energy from sunlight. Algae grow incredibly fast, making it amazingly productive. It is the most promising source of renewable transportation fuel that we have today, far more efficient than ethanol. To replace 100% of our liquid fuel requirements would require planting more than 150 million acres of corn and soybeans but less than 30 million acres of algae. Using corn and soybeans to produce biofuels requires fertile land, fresh water, and lots of fertilizer. And producing biofuels from food crops will reduce our ability to feed the world. Ethanol requires a whole new type of infrastructure to get it to the pumps. With algae biofuels, we go into existing pipelines that we have there today. The process of creating algae-based fuels is in its early stages, but it is happening, and algae biofuels will be affordable, under $2 a gallon, in the next five to 10 years. And that's what you end up with. It's the future of biofuels. Not only do we have the ability to, to grow the algae here, but we have the brain power and the scientists and the academic institutions in San Diego. About 80 miles due west of the Imperial Valley, a singular partnership has come together. The San Diego Center for Algae Biotechnology, or SDCAB, combines world-renowned scientists, chemists, economists, and engineers. One of the things that interested me most about uh, the opportunity with algae is that it represents a convergence of many different disciplines of biology, of aquaculture, chemical engineering. That's what we've tried to do as BioLite as a company, as well as the SDCAB initiative is directed towards bringing together those multiple disciplines that are required for a new algae industry. Located at the University of California, San Diego, the center was initiated by three leading research institutions in the region, UC San Diego, the Scripps Research Institute, and UC San Diego's Scripps Institution of Oceanography. About 50 years ago, Scripps helped to found the University of California, San Diego, for the very reason that we could do projects with the full campus of the UC system that we couldn't do by ourselves. It's particularly exciting to work on the algae project because we see it as a way of solving the very problem that Scripps helped identify 50 years ago, namely the excess carbon dioxide that human beings are putting into the atmosphere. For UC San Diego, the center is a perfect outgrowth of its nationally recognized sustainability 2.0 research and programs and the university's academic and economic mission. Collaborative research is one of the hallmarks of UC San Diego. We expect that by working together with the private sector, with the schools, with the county, with the city, we'll be able to do things that were simply impossible before. We'll create jobs, we'll enrich the economy, we'll use energy in a better way, we'll contribute to a more sustainable future for everyone. It's clear that there's something really special happening here 
that there are scientists from many different areas who are coming together to do something special and something greater than any of us could do by ourselves. Cleantech San Diego was created to position San Diego as a world leader in the green economy. And what is very special about the San Diego region is that we know how to create large economic engines. We know how to take a good idea out of the labs and commercialize it. And scientists exploring the amazing potential of algae are at the heart of it all, driving the economic engine of the future. After spending many years in a career on basic research problems, it's really satisfying to be able to work on something that might actually change the world, improve the economy, and put people to work. We should be talking about creating high-tech and green-collar jobs in the tens of thousands. Jobs that are sorely needed throughout the San Diego region, especially here in the Imperial Valley. There's a real symbiotic relationship between the uh, algae production and the renewable energies and agriculture here in the Imperial County. And so the potential is, uh, is huge for this region. Unemployment in some areas of the Imperial Valley has reached nearly 25%, one of the worst job situations in the nation. The impact on employment in Imperial County with a successful algae industry is going to be, going to be dramatic. Paul Eng and his company Carbon Capture built this algae farm to create jobs, advance science, and make the future better for his children. My youngest child being four years old, uh, they're going to have to deal with the issues from our pollution. And we have an obligation to do the best job we can in capturing CO2. Algae-based fuels will reduce greenhouse gas emissions by reducing the amount of carbon dioxide in the environment. This is a win-win situation because the fuels that we make from this will then be derived from the carbon that we've taken up from the power industry and then we'll burn that. So we'll basically get two cycles on a single carbon which will minimize the loading of the atmosphere with CO2. And there are other secondary benefits. Algae-based fuel products produce feed for livestock, chicken and fish and research into algae will create new medical therapies. And this is the hub where we can really make it happen. I see that uh, the, the ingredients of academia, the ingredients of fellow entrepreneurs who really understand how to make a startup occur, and then those of us coming from big industry who understand how to make something to the sort of scale that we need to, to really make a difference in energy, is all coming together. Working Algae Farms, the world's finest researchers, scientists, and engineers. The right people in the right place. The San Diego Center for Algae Biotechnology. Producing bioenergy from algae is not science fiction. This is science fact. It's real and it's happening now. After all, this is our collective future and it deserves real answers. Scientists, industry, communities, we all need to come together so we can build a better world. The signs are clear. The alarm has been sounded. The time for action is now. We cannot continue to leave so many children behind. This quality education for every child is truly the civil rights issue of today. Every child needs access to that, and we're just not getting there fast enough. Our 12th graders in science and mathematics worldwide are near the bottom. The number of new scientific publications coming out a year is going down proportionate to the growth rate in other countries. The number of new patents is being passed by other countries, and so we're falling behind in science and engineering. We're constantly looking for math and science teachers right now. There are classrooms in San Diego County that have had long-term subs teaching those courses, and, uh, and that doesn't speak well for the future. There are so many students at UCSD that are true science and math whizzes. Their first love is science and math, 
And I guess we're really intrigued with the possibility that if you take someone whose first love is science and math and interest them in teaching, you may actually end up with one of those rare and special kind of teachers that can truly transmit their love and passion for the subject to the students that they teach. Governor Schwarzenegger and the University of California launched California Teach as a way to attract top math and science students into careers in teaching. Elements of this new initiative include a four-year program that will combine a math, science or engineering degree with academic training for teaching credential and a one-year paid teaching internship to help graduates enter the teaching workforce and a mentor teacher program to help students learn the most effective instructional methods and much more. Each campus has been free to develop its own CalTeach program, and so far, 1,600 students have participated statewide. Here at UC San Diego, students can choose between a minor in math education and science education. One of our hopes is that students who are in these minors, uh, science education or math education, will realize early in their career, as early as freshmen when they get involved in these minors, that we can provide them with career opportunities that will capitalize on their abilities in science and mathematics as well as letting them pursue their interests in public service. Our general philosophy was, is that the pedagogy should come out of the content. It should not come out of something that's added on top of courses that you already take. So it's not that you do a mathematics major and then we tell, tell you a little pedagogy on top. The idea was that we wanted to have students learn mathematics in the context of trying to think about how they would teach the subject. And this is really, I think, unique about our program. I often find myself thinking back to Math 87 in that we analyze student mistakes and I think that I'm pretty good as a first year teacher especially. Um, I'm pretty good at looking at what a student is doing and if it's wrong I'm, I can figure out oh they made a mistake here or they might have been thinking this. So Math 87 helped a lot in listening to the student and observing what they were doing to find out what their thinking is. Thinking about their thinking. <laughs> Once students graduate with their bachelor's degree in math, science, or engineering, with a minor in science or mathematics education, they apply to UC San Diego's credential program. UCSD typically places an intern uh, during, its, during that graduate year uh, on a part-time basis, 50, 60 percent uh, of a workload, and uh, they are also participating in a graduate program here, a master's program in education. I found that the UCSD program was really strong in that every project was meaningful. They took the teaching profession really seriously. They continued to encourage us to take teaching really seriously. One of the specificity of CalTeach, which is particularly exciting, is, and it's going on here at UCSD, is taking some of the best math and science students and attracting them towards science careers and teaching careers so that they can become cheerleaders for science for a much larger number of people. That's the most rewarding part when they ask on-topic questions, they're really um, curious about the mathematics and then I can launch into a discourse with them and investigate the mathematics with them because I'm here to communicate mathematics with them so when they're there too that's the best part and when I see the light bulb go on that they're getting it or they want to get it that's the best part for me. They want to learn. UC San Diego prides itself in being a leader in sustainability, and the 1,200-acre campus now has a one-megawatt array of shiny solar panels to show for it and plans for another megawatt in the making. One of the reasons that we're trying to do it is, is our researchers, as many know, uh, kind of led the way. We're leaders in identifying global warming, greenhouse gas, the effects of greenhouse gas emissions. So we, particularly as a campus, felt that it was the right time to green our operations, if you will. 
Students have been instrumental in helping us get this far. They've been a big part of it. Of course, they've been a force in moving us in this direction. And then from the project level, they've been integral to our project. We have several interns that work with us in facilities management, and they've helped us throughout every aspect of the project. Mark Galvan, a student intern majoring in structural engineering, worked closely with facilities management on the project to ensure that the solar panels were made visible to students. So students can really see what we're doing, see that we're making an effort, and uh, working towards that for the future. I think a lot of students, and me included, feel that sustainability is a part of our future and that really we need to, to take control of that and really push for that. Erica Koselik, a student intern with the university's Green Campus and Environment Sustainability Initiative, makes student awareness her business. We're standing on top of the Price Center, which is sort of the hub of student activity on campus. And it's really great that these panels were placed here because students can look up and wonder, oh, what are those solar panels doing here? And it's sort of part of my job to tell them what they're doing here and why they're important and why the school is going green. Solar panels are springing up on campus in other forms, too. This is a solar grove, one of two sites located on campus on the top of a parking structure. Its form and function, each design of the solar tree is based on a natural tree. There's a trunk, branches, and canopy to provide much sought after shade. But we really are trying to promote sustainability and this is just one way of doing it, having an opportunity for people to see it here in action, if you will. As they come here and they park on the structure, as they walk by, you can see it from down below. So it's, it's really a, a great advertisement, if you will, for uh, renewable energy. Each of these solar trees will generate more than 17,000 hours of clean energy per year, and each trunk offers the option to install an outlet to charge electric cars. The solar groves and the solar arrays on top of the Price Center and other buildings on campus were designed, installed, and maintained by two local companies that are partnering with the campus in this landmark effort. The best part, UC San Diego did not have to pay for the installation. One of the things that is available in California, and us also with the federal government, are, are tax credits and incentives. Those types of vehicles are not available to a public university because we don't pay, pay taxes. So what we did was essentially lease our rooftops for a dollar a year to a third party company that does pay taxes and allow them to do the development, the planning, the financing, the ownership and actually sell us back the electricity from the solar panels. So uh, they get to take advantage of those things that we can't take advantage of, rebates and tax credits. We get to have energy at market or below market prices coming from a renewable source and it fits in perfectly with the, the, the academic strategy of the place, which is again to be a living laboratory, allow students to work on this stuff, look at the efficiency of these things, evaluate how they work. So it, it, it's a win-win for everybody. Another groundbreaking green energy project on campus is a student-designed network of five weather monitoring stations that will help the university identify the sunniest rooftops to expand their solar arrays. The weather stations will also use ocean breezes to cool buildings and use water more efficiently in irrigation and other uses. The university is also planning to store power produced at night from a planned 2.8 megawatt green fuel cell and use that energy during peak demand hours the following day when electricity rates are highest. And the way we're going to fuel it is by capturing waste methane from a, a wastewater treatment plant about a dozen miles from here, bring it up to the campus and create this renewable energy. That's the equivalent of roughly 2,500 homes worth of energy. Another way of looking at it is 2.5 times the amount of energy that the solar panels will produce. Again, just one more thing uh, among all these strategies. Think of a quiver with lots of arrows that are pointed towards this target of global warming, and you've got each arrow has a different set of tools. In all, UC San Diego's smart energy grid provides a model for California and the nation, as well as a source of inspiration for students. I think the importance of having um, solar panels and fuel cell and new green technologies on a college campus is particularly important because it's a living laboratory for students. Students, the turnover rate is every year a class graduates, every year a new class comes in, and so we have the opportunity to educate you know, year after year of students about 
green technologies and a university is an innovative place, it's a place where you do cutting edge research and having these technologies here not only demonstrates the university's commitment to green technologies but it also demonstrates its commitment to teach its students about green technologies and empower them to have the skills and knowledge to go out into the workforce and become part of the green job revolution. In San Diego, I'm Larissa Brannan. What we're doing is we're measuring ambient aerosol from the atmosphere. We have an inlet, so we're pulling particles in from the outside atmosphere and down into this instrument. And we actually are doing two types of measurements at once to compare. At the end of the Scripps Pier, one crowded with mini labs, radar towers, and meteorological equipment, atmospheric chemistry professor Lynn Russell and her students have been busy analyzing air. Specifically, they are interested in the tiny airborne particles, or aerosols, that winds are delivering to the pier. We're measuring uh, the total particles, all below one micron, and these particles can come from many different sources, um, both from sea salt and sea spray, from the continent, both from dust and also um, anthropogenic activities, man-made, like soot, fossil fuel burning, cars, all those types of activities on land contribute to the total particles we're measuring here right off the coast. So we're also getting um, emissions from ships that travel up and down the coast and um, transport from Los Angeles of their particles that they emit from their cars and industry and whatnot. And this is the Scripps Pier here. And by using calculations of where those aerosol particles came from using wind trajectories, um, this is Los Angeles and this is Las Vegas, and we've identified that a large fraction of those particles have been coming from this I-15 corridor. The bright red colors indicate the highest concentrations of organic particles. And in particular, the, this is the signature of carboxylic acids, a specific type of organic particle that we've been focusing on. The pier is just one place in which Russell is analyzing aerosols, which can absorb heat or reflect light and serve as the skeletons on which clouds assemble. Often moving along paths of atmospheric water vapor, aerosols influence atmospheric warming and cooling, rainfall and snowfall, sometimes thousands of miles away from their points of origin. But the chemistry and physics going on in this process is so poorly understood that climate scientists consider aerosols effects on clouds to be the top source of uncertainty in climate simulations. Russell is especially interested in organic aerosols, which can be made by anything from plants to diesel burning engines, all with various effects on atmospheric chemistry. Recently, she has traveled to urban and rural areas in North America to characterize which natural and human-made aerosols are in the skies at any given time. Aerosol particles have the direct effect of reflecting light themselves, but they're also an important part of clouds, and clouds are a key part of the climate system that serve both to reflect sunlight and to insulate the Earth, as well as to cause rainfall in different regions. And in those many roles, the composition of the particles as well as their size is key and the, the number, how many are there. And so the particles that can form cloud droplets we call cloud condensation nuclei. And by putting more of them in the atmosphere, you end up making clouds with smaller droplets because you have the same amount of water and you're now spreading it out over a larger number of particles. It's clear that some of the changes in regional rainfall patterns are correlated with changes in particle emissions in urban areas. Russell also takes samples of air that carries pollution from Europe and Asia to the Arctic Circle and creates a condition known as Arctic haze during spring. From a field station in Barrow, Alaska, and a research cruise in the Norwegian Sea, she has made important discoveries in this past year. Nutrients and products of ocean phytoplankton are the dominant source of organic aerosols over the Atlantic much of the year, but Russell also witnessed on both oceans how the human influence extends even to the planet's most remote reaches. One of the most interesting things is in spring you see a lot of particles from the Asian continent, and those Asian particles often show 
both dust and biomass burning, probably from the Siberian region typically, as well as some industrial influences. Over the summer, the concentrations drop way down so that you get very few particles in the summer. In the winter, they pick back up again, again with wind speed, and so those particles are probably more of natural origin. And being able to track that over the entire course of four seasons in one year has given us a lot of really new and interesting information and it has helped us to better understand the reflection of sunlight by particles over as part of the Arctic haze in the Barrow region. Last fall, Russell joined colleagues to form the Aerosol Chemistry and Climate Institute, led jointly by Scripps and the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. The number of researchers joining the quest to understand aerosols is growing to match the complexity and scope of a topic vital to our understanding of what climate will do next. Really being able to bring those together and to understand the big picture is the only way that we're going to be able to reduce the uncertainty associated with aerosol particles and their effects on climate just because there's so many parameters, there's no one instrument or even one person who can do all of it at once. And so it's, a, it's important to have a good collaboration as part of this. This has been a presentation of Scripps Institution of Oceanography at UC San Diego. Visit us online at scripps.ucsd.edu.